Uh, thanks everyone for um, for attending the seminar today and for giving me an opportunity to chat about the research that we do at SASRI. I was very tempted to have a rugby ball bouncing across the screen, but um, only the South Africans would be as excited as that. So I'll I'll stick to the topic and uh, uh, share some of our research on sugarcane improvement via GM technology and mutagenic breeding. So for those of you who don't know the sugar industry very well in South Africa. Uh, it's based um, in KwaZulu-Natal and Mpumalanga, and we really situated on the east coast of South Africa. Most of the sugar cane is rain-fed, so um, we, you know that is somewhat challenging. A small proportion of the industry um, is irrigated, about 10%, and um, that's more northern KZN as well as um, Mpumalanga. We um, have about 14 mills. Um, some are under business rescue at the moment, but um, still crushing, which is great. We have uh, tens of thousands of growers, so about 22,000 growers, but about 90% of these are small scale growers that account for 11% of the crop. Um, essentially, the Sugar Association um, is the is the parent organization and SASRI, which is the research institute, is one of the bodies that falls under Sugar Association. We are fortunate enough that we produce um, enough sugar for all of our domestic market, and half of that sugar is exported, most of it to the South African Customs Union, but the balance to, um, to other um, clients in Africa, Asia, and sometimes even the USA. So the institute, uh, the research institute where I'm based is just north of Durban um, in Mount Edgecombe. And we have about uh, 500 employees that work on six research farms. So most of our breeding, conventional breeding, um, and our selection process is done on these research farms. Uh, so we do um, cater to the different agroclimatic zones um, in South in, um uh, the sugarcane growing area. At Sassery, we've got about 35 scientists. A large proportion of our staff um, are extension specialists and biosecurity specialists. And um, this really helps us to get our exciting research out to growers in the industry. Um, as Laura mentioned, um, we, do, we do quite a bit of postgraduate training and we also have an internship training program. And the research that we, we focus on um, is, is mainly in variety improvement. So about 70% of our budget um, focuses on conventional breeding and selection, um, which in sugarcane takes a, a decade or more. And I'll go into some of the reasons for that a bit later. But we also look at crop protection, smart agriculture, big focus on sustainability, and then enhancing and enabling adoption of our new varieties and our best agronomic um, practices. So that's that's all at SASRI. So by way of an introduction um, to, to the topic, I'm going to start off with conventional breeding. Um, so SASRI was started about almost 100 years ago to really breed uh, sugarcane varieties for cultivation in South Africa. So South Africa's quite far south in terms of sugarcane cultivation. And sugarcane is a tropical crop and we live in a, a subtropical environment. Um, so um, other, other challenges in, in addition to, to the environment are that sugarcane has a complex polyploid and aneuploid genome. So the commercial hybrids that we grow in our days are actually a, the result of an interspecific cross. Um, in South Africa, under the environmental conditions that we have, there's no fertile pollen produced under natural conditions. So this um, great big glass house that you see at the bottom of the picture is um, something that our breeders have to work with. So we have to extend the day length and the nighttime temperatures in order to produce fertile pollen uh, to enable conventional crossing to take place. Um, so essentially, this is what we do at Mount Edgecombe. And then the, the seeds and the progeny that arise from these crosses go out um, to, to various um, places in our industry. So given these difficulties and also the, the challenges with um, 
uh, back crossing, um, which is easy in maize, but not so easy in sugarcane. There is a limited gene pool for um, sugarcane improvement. Um, there's a big unpredictability of obtaining elite progeny because the chromosome number um, varies between 80 to 120. The, the um, you know, the, the polyploidy, we, our N value ranges from 8 to 10. Um, and then there are certain traits that are negatively associated. So, um, for example, Aldana, as you'll um, discover in the next few slides, is a Lepidopteran stalk boring pest, which is a big problem in the industry. And if we, we breed for that, then we get a negative association with a fungal disease called smut. So just to set the scene as to why uh, we may be interested in other genetic modification techniques for sugarcane. So I've obviously mentioned um, conventional breeding. Um, I'm not going to discuss those um, um, other two um, methods for improvement. Um, we're going to look at transgenesis um, in the first section of my talk and then mutagenic breeding in the second part of the talk. And um, genome editing is definitely um, an exciting possibility, but not something that we are um, involved with ourselves at the moment. We are funding some research, um, but we, um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that today. So if we um, look at the rationale for genetically modified sugarcane, um, I've mentioned some of the constraints that we have with um, conventional breeding. Um, and we know that GM, GM has a good track record for improving yield, for reducing crop loss, and for solving particular problems through, um, through specific traits that are available. And we've seen um, evidence of the technology working in the field in other crops, such as maize, um, soybean, cotton, to name a few. So I'm sure most of you um, that are involved in GM research will be very familiar with um, slides like this. What I just want to highlight here is um, two instances of where GM sugarcane has been commercialized. So actually the first was Indonesia who produced a drought tolerant sugarcane plant and then Brazil followed um, in the last few years with GM sugarcane that contains the um, Bacillus thuringiensis or BT cryogene um, for uh, control of their lepidopteran pest called diatria. Just to elaborate a little on the GM sugarcane landscape, um, all of the countries that grow sugarcane have some uh, have an interest in GM sugarcane. Some of them are at the, at the research stage. Some of them, as I mentioned, Indonesia and Brazil have already commercialized GM sugarcane. Um, so in South Africa, um, we are working on BT. Um, uh, insect resistant sugarcane and herbicide tolerant sugarcane. And we, we hope to be able to go to the field in the next couple of years. Um, as I mentioned, the other trait that we're looking at is herbicide tolerance. Um, and so you'll hear about both of these in the next few slides. Uh, just to also perhaps um, give some context to people who are not doing research in South Africa, um, we have great legislation um, the GMO Act, um, which was um, promulgated in 1997. Um, we are signatories to the Cartagena Protocol for Biosafety. And in addition to the, the maize, soybean and cotton, um, mainly for insect resistance and herbicide tolerance, we have, South Africa has um, conducted field trials with other GM plants, um, sugarcane many years ago, um, as well as potato. And our Department of Agriculture issues um, permits for facilities registration. So that would be labs um, that conduct any GMO research, contain field trials, general release. And so that's for commercial cultivation, as well as commodity clearance. So when we import food and feed that is genetically modified, that also goes through the Department of Agriculture. And the process um, for applications, again, for those of you who are not that familiar with it, it's it's very um, 
a very slick process. So there are various application forms that have to be filled in. Uh, these go to the uh, GMO registrar based at the Department of Agriculture. Um, the applications are then reviewed by an advisory committee who um, consists of independent experts. They make a recommendation which goes to the executive council, which essentially is various government departments that then have a look at this. So this includes Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, Trade and Industry, et cetera. They then inform the registrar of the decision and the applicant um, either gets their permit issued or not. So just to make the point that, um, you know, things are very well taken care of legislatively to enable this kind of research. So what has SASRI done? So we have done um, many years worth of research, essentially demonstrating proof of concept. So for example, does the GM technology work? Um, does the gene of interest work in sugarcane? Um, is the trait maintained in the field over several returns because um, sugarcane is vegetatively propagated? So we, um, oh, we have to ensure stability of our trait. And apart from the new trait, does sugarcane still behave in the same way? So we've done some of this research uh, in the past. And just to give you an, an idea of the traits that we've worked with, um, I'll obviously be focusing on the BT cryoproteins against our Lepidopteran stalk borer Aldana. Um, but we've also looked at um, herbicide tolerance to glyphosate and glufosinate ammonium. And those were really the first field trials that we worked with now 20 years ago. We've looked at um, nitrogen use efficiency, where we demonstrated um, efficacy in pot trials and didn't go to field there. We've looked, um, we have an interest in sugarcane uh, mosaic virus resistance, because this is one of the major viral pests in sugarcane. Um, drought tolerance, always um, uh, you know, uh, water use is always um, an issue in, in sugarcane cultivation. So we um, did some work with um, dehydration, responsive um, transcription factors, um, again, also in pots. And then we've done a lot of work on um, sucrose metabolism, learned a, a lot about the processes in sugarcane plants, and unfortunately, never able to demonstrate any um, substantial yield benefit in the field. So um, none of that work is, is really continuing. Um, and let's get on to the, to the main drive of the GM research um, at SASRI at present. So we have a, a suite of Lepidopteran stalk borers, not just, Alde not just Aldana, but one called Sasamia um, in South Africa. There's a very nasty top borer called Kylo, which we don't have in South Africa yet, but our neighboring country, Mozambique, um, battle with that. So it is considered to be a biosecurity risk. And the loss in revenue is fairly substantial. So you may gather um, we have an integrated pest management approach where breeding is, is, a, is a main focus for our institute, but obviously our growers use insecticides. We try to, um, you know, emphasize good soil health as well as good um, eco um, system practices, and then GM sugarcane um, to produce the BT cry protein is also one of the options that we are pursuing. So for those of you who don't know, Bacillus thuringiensis is a, is a ubiquitous soil bacterium. And it, when it sporulates, it produces a crystal protein, wonderful little diamond-shaped proteins under the microscope. Um, that has a very specific mode of action um, to lepidopteran pests, and it's not toxic to non-target insects. The way it works in insects is that the insect um, ingests the, the, the crystalline protein and this um, binds to receptors in the midguts, in the midgut of insect um, pores form, and essentially the insect dies of septicemia. So this is a, a great system which has obviously been transferred 
um, to GM plant production. So generally, the um, cryoproteins will have to have the um, have to have codon optimization for good expression in plants. And um, at SASRI, we introduce um, these gene constructs to um, sugarcane um, via um, microprojectile bombardment. So if you have a look at our little pipeline for production, um, we target um, embryogenic cells and um, yeah, the genetic constructs that we have are introduced via particle bombardment. So you can see that there is quite a long um, time frame required for the production of transgenic sugarcane. Um, so in addition to some molecular analysis, we also um, do efficacy testing using Eldana um, and using various bioassays. So we have an insect rearing uh, department at SASRI and they rear insects for us. So uh, we can do these um, efficacy studies. So it, it really is a great team effort. In terms of molecular analysis, um, you can see that um, obviously we use PCR um, as an as a initial screen um, to check for the presence of the transgenes in, in little um, in vitro plantlets. Then we use the commercially available lateral flow strips to detect cryoprotein expression because we also introducing a herbicide um, tolerance gene, we actually have a, an in vitro rerouting assay where we incorporate the active ingredient um, of the herbicide called amazapur into our growth medium. And then we uh, measure root regrowth. Um, so you can see non-transformed plants die on this medium and the ones that are transformed actually produce some roots. And then also as part of our little in vitro screen, before we take anything further down the pipeline, is that we um, inoculate in vitro plantlets with first instar larvae and have a look at um, damage um, of the little plantlets. So we've got a, a few little screening assays that we use um, along the way to characterize the GM plants. Okay, so just to give you a little more, um, or just to give you an idea of, of how um, well this technology works in sugarcane, um, we do Aldana pot-based bioassays, and um, we measure um, internode damage. So the standard assay that we use, um, and we use this for normal um, sugarcane, our, our normal sugarcane breeding program as well, we, um, okay, so this is just some of the, um, GM resistant cultivars that you're seeing here. You can see on the bottom axis, we have um, transformed quite a few um, different um, cultivars. And if you look at the internode damage um, of the wild type susceptible cultivars. So for example, if you look at N73 here, you can see that the wild type parent um, is usually sort of, um, you know, intermediate um, intermediately resistant to Aldana, but you can see the GM, light, GM events here um, give us complete resistance with no internode damage, which is great. Um, some of our regular controls are on the far right-hand side um, of the plot over here. And um, so in most, in, in all instances, you can see that we get um, significant improvements in Aldana resistance and Aldana damage um, after the insertion of the GM protein. So basically, we um, inoculate sugarcane plants that are about six months old with Aldana larvae. And then we allow 600 day degrees for the insect to complete its life cycle. And then we go in and we split the stalk. We look for larvae, we look for pupa, and we measure damage. So that's essentially how we can do this. And it um, can be done in pots, uh, which is very convenient. Um, okay, so um, Essentially, this all takes a long time, as you may have gathered. So although conventional breeding in sugarcane also takes a long time, so, so does GM um, improvement. Um, if you look at our, our kind of time frame, you can see that we, we are about here at the moment where the big star is. So we are doing um, molecular and glasshouse assessment of lines. But obviously, we um, plan to go to the field because we have to check um, that agronomic performance and yield characteristics are unchanged in our GM lines. 
And then we've got a lot of um, regulatory work to do to um, demonstrate substantive equivalence and, you know, look at food and feed safety. And um, that's before we um, deploy to the industry. So there's still a way to go, but um, I think it was just good to, uh, to share that with you. So just to have a look at some of the regulatory biosafety aspects that we're also looking at. Um, we're looking at gene flow between sugarcane and um, its closest wild relatives, Miscanthidium. Uh, we're looking at inheritance patterns of transgenes. So um, eventually we'd be able, we want to use conventional breeding um, and we just need to need, we need to know how um, transgenes will be trans, you know, um, inherited by progeny at this very complex, complex um, genetic background. We will also um, be wanting to look at um, the proportion of refugia, so non-GM plantings that need to be planted alongside our GM cane to, um, in order to manage um, insect resistance. We need to also look at our monitoring techniques. So as I mentioned earlier on, we've got a large biosecurity inspectorate. So we have inspectors that go out um, and inspect for, for diseases and pests in our sugarcane fields. But how do we really monitor Aldana um, and how do we monitor potential development of resistance of these insects to the Bt genes? So um, IRAC, so this is the Insecticide uh, Resistance Action Committee, have a lab-based assay where you bring in insects from the field and then put them on artificial media containing the cryogenes genes and um, the minute you don't see them all dying, you know you're in trouble. So these are the sorts of assays that we will use for monitoring once we've deployed GM cane in the field. We also need to look at the effect on non-target arthropods. Obviously, we know from the body of literature that um, the cryogenes are very specific against Lepidopteran insects, but um, you know we'll need to demonstrate this in sugarcane. And then at the end of the line, we need to demonstrate um, substantive equivalence. So we will use the OECD consensus documents for compositional analysis. So, um, yeah, really also just want to acknowledge the funding that we've had through Biosafety SA um, and various um, partnering institutes to generate some of this very um, important um, data that goes along with the work that we're doing in the lab. So just a last um, slide on the GM side of things. Um, just want to also um, let people know that we've um, aligned our, ourselves with a global stewardship program. Um, so a company called Excellence Through Stewardship um, has external auditors and they really um, monitor biotech um, improvements or biotech type work. So we had an external audit in 2022 and we'll continue to have one every three years as we uh, develop GM sugarcane. So at the moment, we're still at the early phases of rolling out this technology to our industry, um, but we've, had, we've developed a quality management system and we have an internal audit annually. So I think that's also a very Im important part of uh, letting our growers know exactly what's happening at each stage, what kind of research they're funding, and also just to, just to be transparent in the development of our, our product. Okay, so I've given a, um, a little snapshot of where we are with um, genetic modification in terms of the biotech research that we do at Sastry. And I'm gonna change gear now into um, mutation breeding because this is the other kind of um, crop improvement that we're working on. So mutagenic um, breeding essentially is, is an artificial a mutagenic process um, and we uh, although one can do it through um, radiation mutagenesis we don't have access to a radiation source so we use um, a chemical um, EMS a ethyl methane sulfonate and essentially we've um, targeted two areas of interest the one is herbicide tolerance because this is very important for our sugarcane growers and um, we know that um, a single base pair mutation in an enzyme called acetolactate synthase 
and confer herbicide tolerance to um, imazepur or arsenal. And this is a herbicide that we use in the industry to give us control of the creeping grasses, which can be a big problem in sugarcane fields. The other thing we're looking at is drought tolerance because of climate change and because most of our industry is rain fed. Um, this is a very important um, part of growing sugarcane in the future. And so we will expose callus um, to EMS and then um, select tolerance cells um, in vitro initially. And then obviously we go into, into pot trials um, to assess for um, the trait that we're looking for. So I'll just give you a quick example of, of a very nice um, herbicide tolerant line that's come out of this um, chemi chemical mutagenic breeding effort. So I mentioned herbicide tolerance is a trait that our growers would appreciate. And through the um, EMS protocol, we actually um, took an existing um, variety called N12 and um, made it herbicide tolerant. So we called it N12 Zappa. So it's registered as a, um, a, a new variety, even although the original parent line was produced um, a couple of decades ago at SASRI. So generally um, what happens is that because we've altered the um, mutated, the acetolactate synthase enzyme, um, to which the herbicide normally binds um, and, and therefore can actually kill plants um, by blocking amino acid production. In the tolerant line, um, because the, um, the chemistry of the enzyme has changed, it no longer facilitates binding of the herbicide. So amino acid production can continue unabated. Um, so essentially what we have here is a tolerant line based on not the lethal rate of herbicide, which would be required to kill the sugarcane plant, but about a quarter of that rate. So for those of you that have an interest in mutagenic breeding, there's a, a technology called Clearfield, um, which is applied to sunflowers, wheat and rice, I think. And they use about a quarter of the rate. Um, so the plants are completely tolerant to that. Um, and then you, you can actually control weeds using um, that particular rate. So essentially that's what this is. So we've got a, a really nice product for our growers uh, to use in the field. So the other kind of, of mutagenic breeding that we um, are looking at is essentially epi mutagenic breeding. So, I mean, epi mutagenesis um, essentially involves heritable changes in DNA methylation patterns um, that don't cause that don't that cause change in, in expression, but no alteration in the DNA sequence. So essentially this is this affects the, the methylation patterns of the genome. And the advantages of this over um, GM, for example, or even regular breeding, maybe that you can actually enhance the natural variation and resilience of plants without um, affecting the DNA sequence. We feel that it can reduce the time and cost of developing new varieties compared with conventional breeding or genetic engineering and avoid the regulatory issues associated with GM in GM crops. So this is quite new uh, research that we have started at SASRI. So just to um, highlight some differences um, between this and the chemically induced mutagenic breeding, essentially we use a, um, a demethylation agent called 5-azacytidine or AZAC. And we've um, looked at a few different um, targets. So obviously Aldana is always um, of interest to us. And um, there is a, a fungal pathogen called fusarium, which is often um, associated with Aldana borings in the stalk. Um, there are some varieties, um, as, yeah, variety, um, species of fusarium that are antagonistic to Aldana, but um, we have to ensure that plant um, tolerates these um, fusarium 
um, colonizations. And so we've we've looked at that through um, mutagenic breeding. We are obviously interested in heat and drought tolerance. So we've primed uh, sugarcane cells with um, AZAC to change the methylation patterns um, and done selection of these cells and plants on um, PEG or osmotically um, altered media. And then we also um, have looked at alum aluminium tolerance. So again, um, sticking with the drought theme, plants um, that are tolerant to acidic soil conditions and high aluminium um, might confer an advantage to our growers going forward. Um, so if anyone's interested in any of this research, I can certainly, um, you know, pop me a mail afterwards and I can share some of our papers with you if you're interested. But just to give you a couple of um, slides worth of, of results, um, one of the important concepts um, associated with epimutagenic breeding and sugarcane is, is a concept of chimera dissolution and essentially fixing the genotype. So in vegetatively propagated plants, one actually needs to check that this demethylation and remethylation of the genome is, is stable. Um, and the first um, sort of literature that we came across um, explaining this was actually in bananas. So in bananas, um, where they've applied this kind of breeding, they actually um, have, to, they've got, bananas have got a much bigger um, meristematic growing point compared with sugarcane, and they actually um, slice this meristem in half, um, and then they get two daughter plants, and then basically they continue that selection, and I'll explain how we do it in sugarcane, and anything chimeric eventually over several rounds of vegetative propagation um, gets dissolved. So this is something that we realize we've had to do in sugarcane. How do we do it? So we start off in vitro with our embryogenic callus, much as we do with our GM um, plant material. We expose the cells to azacytidine and then Im immediately um, start the stress while um, the um, epigenome is demethylated. And then during culturing, we hope to um, be able to select away the cells that don't um, that they don't have the, the the methylation that enables them to withstand the stress that's being applied. Then ex vitro, the way sugarcane grows, um, it grows from the apical meristem, stem, but there are buds, um, auxiliary buds along the way, and essentially um, through several rounds of vegetative propagation and splitting the stalk and essentially applying the stress continuously over several rounds of vegetative propagation to material that is derived from these buds, we um, dissolve this chimera. So we are hope so most of this has been done ex vitro in pots and then the selection so um, has been applied in the glass house. So whether it's drought or aluminium, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, we also hope to be able to do this eventually in vitro, might be a bit quicker, um, where we can actually get the um, the tillers coming from the buds at the base of the little in vitro plant um, as, our, as our vegetative propagules. So that's just something um, worth noting. If we have a look at um, what we've done um, under aluminium stress, uh, essentially, we have determined epigenetic differences um, by methylation sensitive AFLP technology. We've used about 16 primers and methylation sensitive um, enzymes, the HPA2 and MSP1. And if we um, have a look at the plants um, that have successively come, th come through our um, vegetative chimera dissolution, um, you can see, um, if you have a look at this um, principal coordinate analysis, where we've looked at, where we've um, got our controls. So this is non-stressed. Um, N51 is the cultivar that we happen to have worked with. And the vegetative rounds, we've looked at plants that come through each successive stage um, of vegetative propagation and stress. Um, this sensitive 
um, control is where we've actually applied the stress. And then we've got a an epi line here, um, which we've called mu2. And you can see that it is actually epigenetically distinct from, from the controls, which all come out together if you look at this um, neighborhood joining tree. Um, and you can see the mutants definitely um, group very differently from, from the controls, whether they've had the uh, aluminum stress applied to the control or not. So that um, is, has really um, worked out very, very nicely. So that was for aluminum. If we have a look at drought tolerance, um, you can see that this was done in pots. Um, so generally we apply 30% water um, for two weeks, no water for seven days, and then we rewater. And if you have a look at um, an epi line, you can see that it's perhaps not as green as the as the non-mutated, non-stressed control, um, but definitely behaves, performs better than a stressed control where we've applied the water stress. And basically these successive rounds of, of vegetative selection are based on um, visual and agronomic measurements. So we look at chlorophyll fluorescence, we look at SPAD, uh, we look at relative water content, growth rate, number of green leaves, um, you know, eventually looking for some sort of drought um, stress tolerance index. Um, and even more recently, um, looking at a much quicker method of, of near infrared um, spectroscopy. But basically, it's done through, through visual um, and agronomic selection. So the next step has really been to take these plants um, out into um, our rain shelter, rain shelter trial at Sassery. So we've got this canopy that can move over the plants when rain um, looks as though it's appearing. Um, and then we can actually make sure that the plants are stressed. And ultimately, they'll go to the field so that they can be agronomically um, compared, um, you know, under um, uh, field growing conditions to, to the parent plant. Okay, so I think um, that's that's about it uh, for now. I'd just like to uh, finish off by saying, um, acknowledging the, the team in, in the biotech department um, who've been participating in the GM work and then um, Stuart and our postdoc who's just recently left have, left have um, really been working on the mutagenic um, breeding approach. So um, yeah, thank you for your time, everyone. And I'm happy to take some questions.